Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close by Jonathan Saffron Fowler Chapter 14 Why I'm Not Where You Are 9-11-03 I don't speak. I'm sorry. My name is Thomas. I'm sorry. I'm still sorry. To my child. I wrote my last letter on the day you died, and I assumed I'd never write another word to you. I've been so wrong about so much of assumed. Why am I surprised to feel the pen in my hand tonight? I'm writing as I wait to meet Oscar. In a little less than an hour, I'll close this book and find him under the streetlight. We'll be on our way to the cemetery, to you, your father, and your son. This is how it happened. I gave a note to your mother's doorman almost two years ago. I watched from across the street as the limousine pulled away. She got out. She touched the door. She changed so much, but I still knew her. Her hands had changed, but the way she touched was the same. She went into the building with a boy. I couldn't see if the doorman gave her my note. I couldn't see her reaction. The boy came out and went into the building across the street. I watched her that night as she stood with her palms against the window. I left another note with the doorman. Do you want to see me again, or should I go away? The next morning, there was a note written on the window. Don't go away. Which meant something, but it didn't mean I want to see you again. I gathered a handful of pebbles and tossed them at her window. Nothing happened. I tossed some more, but she didn't come to the window. I wrote a note in my daybook. Do you want to see me again? I ripped it out and gave it to the doorman. The next morning, I went back. I didn't want to make her life any harder than it was, but I didn't want to give up either. There was a note on the window. I don't want to want to see you again. Which meant something, but it didn't mean yes. I gathered pebbles from the street and threw them at her window, hoping she would hear me and know what I meant. I waited, and she didn't come to the window. I wrote a note, What should I do? And gave it to the doorman. He said, I'll make sure she gets it. I couldn't say thank you. The next morning I went back. There was a note on her window, the first note, Don't go away. I gathered pebbles, I threw them. They tapped like fingers against the glass. I wrote a note, Yes or no? For how long could it go on? The next day I found a market on Broadway and bought an apple. If she didn't want me, I would leave. I didn't know where I would go, but I would turn around and walk away. There was no note on her window, so I threw the apple. Anticipating the glass that would rain down on me, I wasn't afraid of the shards. The apple went through her window and into her apartment. The doorman was standing in front of the building. He said, You're lucky that was open, pal. But I knew I wasn't lucky. He handed me a key. I rode the elevator up and the door was open. The smell brought me back. What, forty years I had struggled not to remember, but couldn't forget. I put the key in my pocket. Only the guest room, she called from our bedroom, the room in which we used to sleep and dream and make love. That was how we began our second life together. When I got off the plane, after eleven hours of travel and forty years away, the man took my passport and asked me the purpose of my visit. I wrote in my day book to mourn, and then I wrote to try to live. He gave me a look and asked if I would consider this business or pleasure. I wrote, neither. For how long do you plan to mourn and try to live? I wrote, for the rest of my life. So you're going to stay? For as long as I can. Are we talking about a weekend or a year? I didn't write anything. The man said, next. I watched the bags go around the carousel. Each one held a person's belongings. I saw babies going around and around, possible lives. I followed the arrows for those with nothing to declare, and that made me want to laugh, but I was silent. One of the guards asked me to come to the side. That's a lot of suitcases for someone with nothing to declare, he said. I nodded, knowing that people with nothing to declare carry the most. I opened the suitcase for him. That's a lot of paper, he said. I showed him my left palm. I mean, that's a whole lot of paper. I wrote, they're letters to my son. I was unable to send them to him when he was still alive. Now he's dead. I don't speak. I'm sorry. The guard looked at the other guard, and they just shared a smile. I don't mind if smiles come at my expense. I'm a small price to pay. They let me through. Not because they believed me, but because they didn't want to try to understand me. I found a payphone and called your mother. That was as far as my plan went. I assumed so much that she was still alive, that she was in the same apartment I'd left 40 years before. I assumed that she would come pick me up, and everything would begin to make sense. We would mourn and try to live. The phone rang and rang. 
We will forgive ourselves. It rang. A woman answered. Hello? I knew it was her. The voice had changed, but the breath was the same. The spaces between the words were the same. I pressed four, three, five, five, six. She said, Hello? I asked, four, seven, four, eight, seven, three, two, five, five, nine, nine, six, eight. She said, Your phone isn't a hundred dollars. Hello? I wanted to reach my hand through the mouthpiece, pull down the line and into her room. I wanted to reach, Yes, I asked, Four seven four eight seven three two five five nine nine six eight. She said, "Hello." I told her, four three five seven. Listen," she said. "I don't know what's wrong with your phone, but all I hear is beeps. Why don't you hang up and try again?" Try again? I was trying to try again. That's what I was doing. I knew it wouldn't help. I knew no good would come of it. But I stood there in the middle of the airport at the beginning of the century, at the end of my life, and I told her everything: why I'd left, where I'd gone, how I'd found out about your death. Why I'd come back, and what I needed to do with the time I had left. I told her because I wanted her to believe me and understand, and because I thought I owed it to her, and to myself, and to you. Or it was just more selfishness, maybe? I broke my life down to letters. For love, I pressed 5683. For death, 33284. When the suffering is subtracted from the joy, what remains? What I wondered is the sum of my life. It took me a long time. I don't know how long. Minutes? Hours? My heart got tired. My finger did. I was trying to destroy the wall between me and my life with my finger. One press at a time. My quarter ran out. Or she hung up. I called again. Four seven four eight seven three two five five nine nine six eight. She said, Is this a joke? A joke? It wasn't a joke. What is a joke? Was it a joke? She hung up, and I called again. Eight four four seven four seven eight eight six two five six five three. She asked, Oscar? That was the first time I ever heard his name. I was in Dresden's train station when I lost everything for the second time. I was writing you a letter that I knew I would never send. Sometimes I wrote from there, sometimes from here, sometimes from the zoo. I didn't care about anything except for the letter I was writing to you. Nothing else existed. It was like when I walked to Anna with my head down, hiding myself from the world, which is why I walked into her and why I didn't notice that people were gathering around the televisions. It wasn't until the second plane hit and someone who didn't mean to holler, hollered, that I looked up. There were hundreds of people around the televisions now. Where had they come from? I stood up and looked. I didn't understand what I was seeing on the screen. Was it a commercial? A new movie? I wrote, What's happened? And showed it to a young businessman watching the television. He took a sip of his coffee and said, No one knows yet. His coffee haunts me. His yet haunts me. I stood there, a person in a crowd, was I watching the images, or was there something more complicated happening? I tried to count the floors above where the planes had hit. The fire had to burn through the buildings. I knew that those people couldn't be saved. And how many were on the planes, and how many were on the street? I thought and thought. On my walk home, I stopped in front of an electronics store. The front window was a grid of televisions. All but one of them were showing the buildings, the same images, over and over, as if the world itself were repeating. A crowd had gathered on the sidewalk. One television, off to the side, was showing a nature program. A lion was eating a flamingo. The crowd became noisy. Someone who didn't mean to holler hollered. Pink feathers. I looked at one of the other televisions, and then there was only one building. One hundred ceilings had become one hundred floors, which had become nothing. I was the only one who could believe it. The sky was filled with paper. Pink feathers. The cafes were full that afternoon. People were laughing. There were lines in front of the movie theaters. They were going to see comedies. The world is so big and so small. At the same moment, we were close and far. In the days and weeks that followed, I read the list of the dead in the paper. Mother of three, college sophomore, Yankees fan, lawyer, brother, bond trader, weekend magician, practical joker, sister, philanthropist, middle son, dog lover, janitor, only child, entrepreneur, waitress, grandfather of 14, registered nurse, accountant, intern, jazz saxophonist, doting uncle, army reservist, late night poet, sister, window washer, scrabble player, volunteer fireman, Father, father, elevator repairman, wine aficionado, office manager, secretary, cook, financier, executive vice president, bird watcher, father, dishwasher, Vietnam veteran, new mother, avid reader, only child, competitive chess player, soccer coach, brother, analyst, maitre d', black belt, CEO, bridge partner, architect, plumber, public relations executive, father, artist, and residence, 
urban planner, newlywed investment banker, chef, electrical engineer, new father who had a cold that morning and thought about calling in sick. And then, one day I saw it, Thomas Shell. My first thought was that I had died. He lives behind a wife and son. I thought my son. I thought my grandson. I thought and thought and thought, and then I stopped thinking. When the plane descended and I saw Manhattan for the first time in 40 years, I didn't know if I was going to go up or down. The lights were stars. I didn't recognize any of the buildings. I told the man to try to live. I declared nothing. I called your mother, but I couldn't explain myself. I called again. She thought it was a joke. I called again, and she said, Oscar? I went to the magazine stand and got more quarters. I tried again. It rang and rang. I tried it again, and it rang. I waited and tried again. I sat on the ground, not knowing what would happen next, not even knowing what I wanted to happen next. I tried once more. Hello, you've reached the Shell residence. I'm speaking like an answering machine, even though it's really me on the phone. If you'd like to talk to me or Grandma, please begin at the beep sound that I'm about to make. Beep! Hello? It was a child's voice. A boy's. It's really me. I'm here. Bonjour? I hung up. Grandma? I needed time to think. A taxi would be too quick, as would a bus. What was I afraid of? I put the suitcases on a push cart and started walking. I was amazed that no one tried to stop me, not even as I pushed the cart under the street, not even as I pushed it on the side of the highway. With each step, it became brighter and hotter. After only a few minutes, it was clear I wouldn't be able to manage. I opened one of the suitcases and took out my stack of letters. To my child. They are from 1977. To my child. To my child. I thought about laying them on the road beside me, creating a trail of things I wasn't able to tell you. It might have made my load possible, but I couldn't. I needed to get them to you, to my child. I hailed a cab. By the time we reached your mother's apartment, it was already getting late. I needed to find a hotel. I needed food and a shower and time to think. I ripped a page from the daybook and wrote, I'm sorry. I handed it to the doorman, and he said, Who's this for? I wrote, Mrs. Shell. He said, There is no Mrs. Shell. I wrote, There is. He said, Believe me, I'd know if there was a Mrs. Shell in this building. But I'd heard her voice on the phone. Could she have moved and kept the number? How would I find her? I needed the phone book. I wrote 3D and showed it to the doorman. He said, Oh, Miss Schmidt. I took back my book and wrote, That was her maiden name. I lived in the guest room. She left me meals by the door. I could hear her footsteps, and sometimes I thought I heard the rim of a glass against the door. Was it a glass I once drank water from? Had it ever been touched by her lips? I found my day books from before I left. They were in the body of the grandfather clock. I'd have thought she would have thrown them away, but she kept them. Many were empty and many were filled. I wandered through them. I found the book from the afternoon we met and the book from the day we got married. I found our first nothing place and the last time we walked around the reservoir. I found pictures of banisters and sinks and fireplaces. On top of one of the stacks was a book from the first time I tried to leave. I haven't always been silent. I used to talk and talk and talk. I don't know if she began to feel sorry for me, or sorry for herself, but she started paying me short visits. She wouldn't say anything at first, only tidy up the room, brush cobwebs from the corners, vacuum the carpet, straighten the picture frames, and then one day, she dusted the bedside table, and she said, I can forgive you for leaving, but not for coming back. She walked out and closed the door behind her. I didn't see her again for three days, and then it was as if nothing had been said. She replaced the light bulb, and it worked fine. She picked things up and put them down and said, I'm not going to share this grief with you. She closed the door behind her. Was I the prisoner or the guard? Her visits became longer. We never had conversations and she didn't like to look at me. But something was happening. We were getting closer or farther apart. I took a chance. I asked if she would pose for me, like when we first met. She opened her mouth and nothing came out. She touched my left hand, which I hadn't realized was in a fist. That was how she said yes. Or was that how she touched me? I went to the art supply store to buy some clay, but I couldn't keep my hands to myself. The pastels and long boxes, the palette knives, the handmade paper hanging on rolls. I tested every sample. I wrote my name in blue pen and in green oil stick, in orange crayon and in charcoal. It felt like I was signing the contract of my life. I was there for more than an hour, although I bought only a simple block of clay. When I came home, she was waiting for me in the guest room. She was in a robe, standing beside the bed. Did you make any sculptures while you were away? I wrote that I had tried but couldn't. Not even one? I showed her my right hand. 
Did you think about sculptures? Did you make them in your head? I showed her my left hand. She took off her robe and went onto the sofa. I couldn't look at her. I took the clay from the bag and set it on the card table. Did you ever make a sculpture of me in your head? I wrote. How do you want to pose? She said the whole point is that I should choose. I asked if the carpeting was new and she said, look at me. I tried but I couldn't. She said, look at me or leave me, but don't stay and look at anything else. I asked her to lie on her back, but that wasn't right. I asked her to sit. It wasn't right. Cross your arms. Turn your head away from me. Nothing was right. She said, show me how. I went over to her. I undid her hair. I pressed down on her shoulders. I wanted to touch her across all of those distances, and she said, I haven't been touched since you left. Not in that way. I pulled back my hand, and she took it in hers and pressed it against her shoulder. I didn't know what to say. She asked, have you? What's the point of a lie that doesn't protect anything? I showed her my left hand. Who touched you? My daybook was filled, so I wrote on the wall. I wanted so much to have a life. Who? I couldn't believe the honesty as it traveled down my arm and came out my pen. I paid for it. She didn't lose her pose. Were they pretty? That wasn't the point. But were they? Some of them. So you just gave them money and that was it? I like to talk to them. I talked about you. Is that supposed to make me feel good? I looked at the clay. Did you tell them that I was pregnant when you left? I showed her my left hand. Did you tell them about Anna? I showed her my left hand. Did you care for any of them? I looked at the clay and she said, I love that you're telling me the truth. And she took my hand from her shoulder and pressed it between her legs. She didn't turn her head to the side. She didn't close her eyes. She stared at her hands between her legs. I felt like I was killing something. She undid my belt and unzipped my pants. She reached her hand under my underpants. I'm nervous, I said by smiling. It's okay, she said. I'm sorry, I said by smiling. It's okay, she said. She closed the door behind her and opened it and asked, Did you ever make a sculpture of me in your head? There won't be enough pages in this book for me to tell you what I need to tell you. I could write smaller. I could slice the pages down their edges to make two pages. I could write over my own writing. But then what? Every afternoon, someone would come to the apartment. I could hear the door opening and the footsteps, little footsteps. I heard talking, a child's voice, almost a song. It was the voice I'd heard when I called from the airport. The two of them would talk for hours. I asked her one evening, when she came to pose, who paid her all of those visits? She said, my grandson. I have a grandson? No, she said, I have a grandson. What's his name? We tried again. We took off each other's clothes with the slowness of people who know how easy it is to be proven wrong. She lay face down on the bed. Her waist was irritated from pants that hadn't fit her in years. Her thighs were scarred. I needed them with yes and no, and she said, Don't look at anything else. I spread her legs, and she inhaled. I could stare into the most private part of her, and she couldn't see me looking. I slid my hand under her, and she bent her knees. I closed my eyes, and she said, Lie on top of me. There was nowhere to write that I was nervous. She said, Lie on top of me. I was afraid I'd crush her. She said, all of you, on all of me. I let myself sink into her. She said, that's what I've wanted. Why couldn't I have left it like that? Why did I have to write anything else? I should have broken my fingers. I took a pen from the bedside table and wrote, can I see him? On my arm. She turned over, spilling my body next to her. No. I begged with my hands. No. Please? Please. I won't let him know who I am. I just want to see him. No. Why not? Because. Because why? Because I changed his diapers, and I couldn't sleep on my stomach for two years, and I taught him how to speak, and I cried when he cried, and when he was unreasonable, he yelled at me. I'll hide in the coat closet and look through the keyhole. I thought she would say no, she said. If he ever sees you, you'll have betrayed me. Did she feel pity for me? Did she want me to suffer? The next morning, she led me to the coat closet, which faces the living room. She went in with me. We were in there all day, although she knew he wouldn't come home until the afternoon. It was too small. We needed more space between us. We needed nothing places. And she said, this is what it's felt like, except that you weren't here. 
We looked at each other in silence for hours. When the bell rang, she went to let him in. I was on my hands and knees so my eye would be at the right level. Through the keyhole, I saw the door open. Those white shoes. Oscar, she said, lifting him from the ground. I'm okay, he said. That song in his voice. I heard my own voice and my father's and grandfather's. It was the first time I'd ever heard your voice. Oscar, she said again, lifting him again. I saw his face and his eyes. I'm okay, he said again. He asked her where she had been. I was talking to the renter, she said. The renter? Is he still here? He asked. No, she said. He had gone to run some errands. But how did he get out of the apartment? He left right before you came. But you said you were just talking to him. He knew about me. He didn't know who I was, but he knew someone was there, and he knew she wasn't telling the truth. I could hear it in his voice, in my voice, in your voice. I needed to talk to him. But what did I need to say? I'm your grandfather. I love you. I'm sorry. Maybe I needed to tell him things that I couldn't tell you, give him all the letters that were supposed to be for your eyes. But she would never give me permission, and I wouldn't betray her. So I started to think about other ways. What am I going to do? I need more room. I have things I need to say. My words are pushing at the walls of this paper's edge. The next day, your mother came to the guest room and posed for me. I worked the clay with yes and no. I made it soft. I pressed my thumbs into her cheeks, bringing her nose forward, leaving my thumbprints. I carved out pupils. I strengthened her brow. I hollowed out the space between her bottom lip and chin. I picked up a day book and went over to her. I started to write about where I'd been and what I'd done since I left how I'd made my living, whom I'd spent my time with, what I'd thought about, what I'd listened to and eaten, but she ripped the page from the book. I don't care, she said. I don't know if she really didn't care if it was something else. On the blank page I wrote, if there's anything that you want to know, I'll tell you, she said. I know it will make your life easier to tell me, but I don't want to know anything. How could that be? I asked her to tell me about you, she said. Not our son, my son. I asked her to tell me about her son. She said, Every Thanksgiving, I made a turkey and pumpkin pie. I would go to the schoolyard and ask the children what toys they liked. I bought those for him. I wouldn't let anyone speak a foreign language in the apartment, but he still became you. He became me. Everything was yes and no. Did he go to college? I begged him to stay close, but he went to California. In that way, he was also like you. What did he study? He was going to be a lawyer, but he took over the business. He hated jewelry. Why didn't you sell it? I begged him. I begged him to be a lawyer. Then why? He wanted to be his own father. I'm sorry. If that's true, the last thing I would have wanted was for you to be like me. I left so you could be you. She said, he tried to find you once. I gave him that only letter you ever sent. He was obsessed with it, always reading it. I don't know what you wrote, but it made him go and look for you. On the next blank page I wrote, I opened the door one day and there he was. He found you? We talked about nothing. I didn't know he found you. He wouldn't tell me who he was. He must have become nervous, or he must have hated me once he saw me. He pretended to be a journalist. It was so terrible. He said he was doing a story about the survivors of Dresden. Did you tell him what happened to you that night? It was in the letter. What did you write? You didn't read it? You didn't send it to me? It was terrible. All of the things we couldn't share. The room was filled with conversations we weren't having. I didn't tell her that after you left, I stopped eating. I got so skinny that the bath water would collect between my bones. Why didn't anyone ask me why I was so skinny? If someone had asked, I never would have eaten another bite. But did he tell you he was your son? How did you know? I knew because he was my son. She put her hands on my chest, over my heart. I put my hands on her thighs. I put my hands around her. She undid my pants. I'm nervous. Despite everything I wanted, the sculpture was looking more and more like Anna. She closed the door behind her. I'm running out of room. I spent most of my days walking around the city, getting to know it again. I went to the old Colombian bakery, but it wasn't there anymore. In its place was a 99 cent store where everything cost more than 99 cents. I went by the tailor shop where I used to get my pants taken in, but there was a bank. You needed a card just to open the door. I walked for hours down one side of Broadway and up the other. Where there had been a watch repair store, there was a video store. Where there had been a flower market, there was a store for video games. Where there had been a butcher, was a sushi. What sushi? 
And what happens to all those broken watches? I spend hours at the dog run on the site of the Natural History Museum, a pit bull, a Labrador, a golden retriever. I was the only person without a dog. I thought and thought, how could I be close to Oscar from far away? How could I be fair to you and fair to your mother and fair to myself? I wanted to carry the closet door with me so I could always look at him through the keyhole. I did the next best thing. I learned his life from a distance. When he went to school, when he came home, where his friends lived, what stores he liked to go to. I followed him all over the city, but I didn't betray your mother because I never let him know I was there. I thought, it could go on like that forever, and yet here I am. Once again, I was proven wrong. I don't remember when the strangeness of it first occurred to me. How much he was out, how many neighborhoods we went to, why I was the only one watching him. How his mother could let him wander so far so alone. Every week in morning, he left the building with an old man and went knocking on doors around the city. I made a map of where they went, but I couldn't make sense of it. It made no sense. What were they doing? And who was the old man? A friend? A teacher? A replacement for a missing grandfather? And why did they stay for only a few minutes at each apartment? Were they selling something? Collecting information? And what did his grandmother know? Was I the only one worried about him? After they left one house on Staten Island, I waited around and knocked on the door. I can't believe it, the woman said. Another visitor. I'm sorry, I wrote. I don't speak. That was my grandson who just left. Could you tell me what he was doing here? The woman told me, What a strange family you are. I thought, family we are. I just got off the phone with his mother. I wrote, Why was he here? She said, For the key. I asked, What key? She said, For the lock. What lock? Don't you know? For eight months, I followed him and talked to the people he talked to. I tried to learn about him as he tried to learn about you. He was trying to find you just as you tried to find me. It broke my heart into more pieces than my heart was made of. Why can't people say what they mean at the time? One afternoon, I followed him downtown. We sat across from each other on the subway. The old man looked at me. I was staring. I was reaching my arms out in front of me. Did he know that I should have been the one sitting next to Oscar? They went into a coffee store. On the way back, I lost them. It happened all the time. It's hard to stay close without making yourself known, and I wouldn't betray her. When I got back to the Upper West Side, I went into a bookstore. I couldn't go to the apartment yet. I needed time to think. At the end of the aisle, I saw a man who I thought might be Simon Goldberg. He was also in the children's section. The more I looked at him, the more unsure I was. The more I wanted it to be him. Had he gone to work instead of to his death? My hand shook against the change in my pocket. I tried not to stare. I tried not to reach my arms out in front of me. Could it be? Did he recognize me? He'd written, It is my great hope that our paths, however long and winding, will cross again. Fifty years later, he wore the same thick glasses. I'd never seen a whiter shirt. He had a hard time letting go of books. I went up to him. I don't speak. I wrote, I'm sorry. He wrapped his arms around me and squeezed. I could feel his heart beating against my heart. They were trying to beat in unison. Without saying a word, he turned around and rushed away from me, out of the store, into the street. I'm almost sure it wasn't him. I won an infinitely long, blank book in the rest of time. The next day, Oscar and the old man went to the Empire State Building. I waited for them on the street. I kept looking up, trying to see him. My neck was burning. He was looking down at me. Were we sharing something without either of us knowing it? After an hour, the elevator doors opened and the old man came out. Was he going to leave Oscar up there so high up, so alone? Who would keep him safe? I hated him. I started to write something. He came up to me and grabbed me by the collar. Listen, he said. I don't know who you are, but I've seen you following us, and I don't like it. Not a bit. This is the only time I'm going to tell you to stay away. My book had fallen to the floor, so I couldn't say anything. If I ever see you again, anywhere near that boy. I pointed at the floor. He let go of my collar. I picked up the book and wrote, I'm Oscar's grandfather. I don't speak. I'm sorry. His grandfather? I flipped back and pointed at what I'd been writing. Where is he? Oscar doesn't have a grandfather. I pointed at the page. He's walking down the stairs. I quickly explained everything as best I could, my handwriting becoming illegible. He said, Oscar wouldn't lie to me. I wrote, He didn't lie. He doesn't know. The old man took a necklace from under his shirt and looked at it. The pendant was a compass. He said, Oscar's my friend. I have to tell him. He is my grandson. Please don't. You're the one who should be going around with him. I have been. And what about his mother? What about his mother? We heard Oscar singing from around the corner. His voice was getting louder. The old man said, He's a good boy, and walked away. 
I went straight home. The apartment was empty. I thought about packing my bags. I thought about jumping out a window. I sat on the bed and thought, I thought about you. What kind of food did you like? What was your favorite song? Who was the first girl you kissed and where and how? I'm running out of room. I want an infinitely long blank book and forever. I don't know how much time passed. It didn't matter. I'd lost all my reasons to keep track. Someone rang the bell. I didn't get up. I didn't care who it was. I wanted to be alone. On the other side of the window, I heard the door open and heard his voice. My reason. Grandma? He was in the apartment. It was just the two of us, grandfather and grandson. I heard him going from room to room, moving things, opening and closing. What was he looking for? Why was he always looking? He came to my door. Grandma? I didn't want to betray her. I turned off the lights. What was I so afraid of? Grandma? He started crying. My grandson was crying. Please, I really need help. If you're in there, please come out. I turned on the light. Why wasn't I more afraid? Please. I opened the door and we faced each other. I faced myself. Are you the runner? I went back into the room and got this daybook from the closet. This book that is nearly out of pages. I brought it to him and wrote, I don't speak. I'm sorry. I was so grateful to have him looking at me. He asked me who I was. I didn't know what to tell him. I invited him into the room. He asked me if I was a stranger. I didn't know what to tell him. He was still crying. I didn't know how to hold him. I'm running out of room. I brought him over to the bed and he sat down. I didn't ask him any questions or tell him what I already knew. We didn't talk about unimportant things. We didn't become friends. I could have been anyone. He began at the beginning. The vase, the key, Brooklyn, Queens. I knew the lines by heart. Poor child, telling everything to a stranger. I wanted to build walls around him. I wanted to separate inside from outside. I wanted to give him an infinitely long blank book and the rest of time. He told me how he'd just gone up to the top of the Empire State Building and how his friend had told him he was finished. It wasn't what I'd wanted, but if it was necessary to bring my grandson face to face with me, it was worth it. Anything would have been. I wanted to touch him to tell him, even if everyone else left everyone, I would never leave him. We talked and talked. His words fell through him, trying to find the floor of his sadness. My dad, he said. My dad. He ran across the street and came back with a phone. These are his last words. Message 5. 10.04 a.m. It's da dad. Help. Dad. No if. Arn. Annie. This. I'm. Hello? You hear me? We. To the roof. Everything. Okay. Fine. Soon. Sorry. Hear me? Much happens. Remember. The message was cut off. You sounded so calm. You didn't sound like someone who was about to die. I wish we could have sat across the table and talked about nothing for hours. I wish we could have wasted time. I want an infinitely blank book in the rest of time. I told Oscar it was best not to let his grandma know that we'd met. He didn't ask why. I wonder what he knew. I told him if he ever wanted to talk to me, he could throw pebbles at the guest room window and I would come down to meet him on the corner. I was afraid I'd never get to see him again. To see him seeing me? That night was the first time your mother and I made love since I returned, and the last time we ever made love. It didn't feel like the last time. I'd kissed Anna for the last time, seen my parents for the last time, spoken for the last time. Why didn't I learn to treat everything like it was the last time? My greatest regret is how much I believed in the future. She said, I want to show you something. She led me to the second bedroom. Her hand was squeezing yes. She opened the door and pointed at the bed. That's where he used to sleep. I touched the sheets. I lowered myself to the floor and smelled the pillow. I wanted anything of you that I could have. I wanted dust, she said. Years and years ago, 30 years. I lay on the bed. I wanted to feel what you felt. I wanted to tell you everything. She lay next to me. She asked, do you believe in heaven and hell? I held up my right hand. Neither do I, she said. I think after you live, it's like before you lived. Her hand was open. I put yes into it. She closed her fingers around mine, and she said, Think of all the things that haven't been born yet, all the babies. Some never will be born. Is that sad? I didn't know if it was sad. All the parents that would never meet, all the miscarriages. I closed my eyes, and she said, A few days before the bombing, my father took me out to the shed. He gave me a sip of whiskey and let me try his pipe. It made me feel so adult, so special. He asked me what I knew about sex. I coughed and coughed. 
He laughed and laughed and then became serious. He asked if I knew how to pack a suitcase and if I knew never to accept the first offer and if I could start a fire if I had to. I loved my father very much. I loved him very, very much, but I never found a way to tell him. I turned my head to the side. I rested it on her shoulder. She put her hand on my cheek, just like my mother used to. Everything she did reminded me of somebody else. It's a shame, she said, that life is so precious. I turned out of my side and put my arm around her. I'm running out of room. My eyes were closed and I kissed her. Her lips were my mother's lips and Anna's lips and your lips. I didn't know how to be with her and to be with her. It makes us worry so much, she said. Unbuttoning her shirt, I unbuttoned mine. She took off her pants. I took off mine. We worry so much. I touched her and touched everyone. It's all we do. We made love for the last time. I was with her and with everyone. When she got up to go to the bathroom, there was blood on the sheets. I went back to the guest room to sleep. There are so many things you'll never know. The next morning, I was awoken by a tapping on the window. I told your mother I was going for a walk. She didn't ask anything. What did she know? Why did she let me go out of her sight? Oscar was waiting for me under the street lamp. He said, I want to dig up his grave. I've seen him every day for the past two months. We've been planning what's about to happen down to the smallest detail. We've even practiced digging in Central Park. The details have begun to remind me of rules. I can't eat dinner. My mouth is too dry from digging in.